chapter twenty six of our friend the charlatan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our friend the charlatan by george gissing chapter twenty six dyce walked about the room without knowing it he sang softly to himself his countenance was radiant so after all constance would be his wife one moment's glimpse of a dread possibility that neither she nor may tomalin benefited by lady ogram's will had sufficed to make him more than contented with the actual issue of his late complications he had seen himself overwhelmed with disaster reduced to the alternative of withdrawing into ignominious obscurity or of again seeking aid from mrs woolstan aid which might or not be granted and in any case would only enable him to go through with the contest at hollingford a useless effort if he had nothing henceforth to live upon as it was he saw constance and seventy thousand pounds with the prosperous little paper-mill to boot he did not love constance but the feeling of dislike with which he had recently come to regard her had quite passed away he did not love constance but what a capable woman she was and what a help she would be to him in his career her having detected his philosophic plagiarism seemed to him now rather a good thing than otherwise it spared him the annoyance of intellectual dishonesty in his domestic life and put them in a position to discuss freely the political and social views by which he was to stand after all constance was the only woman he knew whose intelligence he really respected after all remembering their intimacy long ago at alverholme he felt a fitness in this fated sequel it gave him the pleasant sense of honourable conduct he smiled at the thought that he had fancied himself in love with may tomalin the girl was a half-educated simpleton who would only have made him ridiculous her anonymous letter pointed to a grave fault of breeding it would always have been suggestive of disagreeable possibilities may was thoroughly plebeian in origin and her resemblance to lady ogram might develop in a way it made him shudder to think of constance bride came of gentle folk and needed only the favour of circumstances to show herself perfectly at ease in whatever social surroundings she had a natural dignity which now he came to reflect upon it he had always observed with pleasure what could have been more difficult than her relations with lady ogram yet she had always borne herself with graceful independence poor girl she had gone through a hard time these last four weeks and no wonder if she broke down under the strain of a situation such as that which ended in lady ogram's death he would make up to her for it all she should understand him and rest in perfect confidence yes he would reveal to her his whole heart and mind so that no doubt of him no slightest distrust could ever disturb her peace not only did he owe her this complete sincerity to him it would be no less delightful no less tranquillizing he sat down to write a note dear constance yes that sufficed when can i see you let it be as soon as possible of course you have understood my silence do you stay at rivenoak a little longer let me come to-morrow if possible after a little reflection he signed himself ever yours d l having dispatched this by private messenger he went out and took a walk choosing the direction away from rivenoak as he rambled along an uninteresting road it occurred to him that he ought to write to mrs woolstan 
no need of course to say anything about the results of lady ogram's decease but he really owed iris a letter just to show that he was not unmindful of her kindness the foolish little woman had done her best for him indeed without her help where would he have been now he must pay his debt to her as soon as possible and it would of course be necessary to speak of the matter to constance not perhaps till after their marriage well he would see he might possibly have an impulse happily this was the very last of the unpleasant details he would have to dismiss the luxury of living without concealment unembarrassed and unafraid by the by how would constance understand the duties of her trusteeship what portion of her income would she feel at liberty to set apart for personal uses in all likelihood she had spoken of that with lady ogram at their coming interview she would fully explain her position he returned to the hotel and dined alone to his disappointment there came no answer from rivenoak was it possible that constance had already gone away very unlikely so soon after the funeral she would reply no doubt by post indeed there was no hurry and a little reserve on her part would be quite natural morning brought him the expected letter dear mr lashmar oh that was nothing merely the reserve he had anticipated he liked her the better for it i shall be at home all to-morrow busy with many things could you come about three o'clock sincerely yours constance bride what could be in better taste how else could she write under the circumstances his real wooing had not yet begun and she merely reminded him of that with all gentleness so in the afternoon he once more presented himself at rivenoak and once more followed the servant into the drawing-room constance sat there she rose as he approached and silently gave her hand he thought she looked rather pale that might be the effect of black attire which made a noticeable change in her appearance but a certain dignity of which the visitor was very sensible a grace of movement and of bearing which seemed new to her could not be attributed to the dress she wore in a saddened voice he hoped that she was well that she had not suffered from the agitations of the past week and with courtesy such as she might have used to any one constance replied that she felt a little tired not quite herself they talked for some minutes in this way lashmar learnt that the amoses had returned to london for the present you stay here he said the interrogative accent only just perceptible for a day or two my secretaryship goes on of course i have a good deal of correspondence to see to on his way hither lashmar had imagined quite a different meeting he anticipated an emotional scene beginning with forced calm on constance's side leading on to reproaches explanations and masculine triumph but constance was strangely self-possessed and her mind seemed to be not at all occupied with agitating subjects lashmar was puzzled he felt it wise to imitate her example to behave as quietly and naturally as possible taking for granted that she viewed the situation even as he did he turned his eyes to the marble bust on its pedestal behind constance the note of scorn in its fixed smile caught his attention so that is to stand in the hospital he murmured yes i believe so replied constance absently with a glance towards the white face what strange stories it will give rise to in days to come she will become a legendary figure i can hardly believe that i saw and talked with her only a few days ago have you the same feeling at all doesn't she seem to you more like someone you have read of than a person you really knew i understand what you mean said constance smiling thoughtfully it's certain one will never again know any one like her are all the provisions of her will practicable perfectly i think she took great trouble to make them so by the by from whom did you get your information 
it was asked in a disinterested voice the speaker's look resting for a moment on lashmar with unembarrassed directness mrs toplady told me about the will dyce paused for a moment then continued with an obvious effort indeed but in an even voice she came to see me after the funeral mrs toplady has a persevering curiosity she wanted to know what had happened and i have no doubt had recourse to me after finding that you were not disposed to talk as freely as she wished i was able to enlighten her on one point may i ask what point she began by telling me that miss tomalin was at her house she had heard miss tomalin's story with the result that she supposed me in honour bound to marry that young lady i explained that this was by no means the case how did you explain it asked constance still in her disinterested tone by telling the simple truth that miss tomalin had herself cancelled the engagement existing between us i see constance leaned back in her chair she looked like one who is sitting alone occupied with tranquil reflection dyce allowed a moment to elapse before he again spoke he was smiling to himself how strange it all is he at length resumed as though starting from a reverie this past fortnight seems already as dim and vague to me as the recollection of something that happened long years ago i never believed myself capable of such follies tell me frankly he leaned towards constance gazing at her in an amused confidential way could you have imagined that i should ever lose my head like that and run off into such vagaries constance also smiled but very faintly her eyebrows rose ever so little her lips just moved but uttered no sound you know me better than any one else ever did or ever will he went on it is quite possible that you know me better than i know myself did you ever foresee such a possibility i can't say that it astonished me was the deliberate reply without any ironic note well i am glad of that said dyce with a little sign of relief it's much better so i like to think that you read me with so clear an eye for years i have studied myself and i thought i knew how i should act in any given circumstances yet it was mere illusion what i regret is that i hadn't talked more to you about such things you would very likely have put me on my guard i always felt your power of reading character it seemed to me that i concealed nothing from you we were always so frank with each other yet not frank enough after all i'm afraid not assented the listener absently well it's an experience though as i say more like a bit of delirium than actual life happily you know all about it i shall never have to tell you the absurd story but i mustn't forget that other thing which really did surprise and vex you my bit of foolish plagiarism i have so wanted to talk to you about it you have read the whole book very carefully and what do you think of it he asked with an air of keen interest just what i thought of the large quotations i had heard from you the theory seems plausible i should think there is a good deal of truth in it in any case it helps one to direct one's life oh you feel that now there exclaimed lashmar's eye brightening is the explanation of what seemed to you very dishonourable behaviour in me you know me and you will understand as soon as i hint at the psychology of the thing when that book fell into my hands i was seeking eagerly for a theory of the world by which to live i have had many glimpses of the truth about life glimpses gained by my own honest thought this book completed the theory i had been shaping for myself it brought me mental rest and a sense of fixed purpose such as i had never known its reconciliation of the aristocratic principle with a true socialism was exactly what i had been striving for it put me at harmony with myself for you know that i am at the same time aristocrat and socialist well now i spoke of the book to my father and begged him to read it it was when we met at alverholme in the spring you remember how long ago does that seem to you to me several years yes i had the volume with me and showed it to my father sufficient proof that i had no intention of using it dishonestly but follow me i beg i had so absorbed the theory 
so thoroughly made it the directing principle of my mind that i very soon ceased to think of it as somebody else's work i completed it with all sorts of new illustrations confirmations which had been hanging loose in my memory and the result was that i one day found myself talking about it as if it had originated with me if i am not mistaken i was talking with dymchurch yes it was dymchurch when i had time to reflect i saw what i had unconsciously done quite unconsciously believe me i thought it over ought i to let dymchurch know where i had got my central idea and i decided at length that i would say nothing constance leaning back in her chair listened attentively with impartial countenance you see why don't you his voice thrilled with earnestness his eyes shone as if with the very light of truth to say calmly by the by i came across that biosociological theory and such and such a book would have been a flagrant injustice to myself i couldn't ask dymchurch to listen whilst i elaborately expounded my mental and spiritual history during the past year or two yet short of that there was no way of making him understand the situation the thing had become mine i thought by it and lived by it i couldn't bear to speak of it as merely an interesting hypothesis discovered in the course of my reading at once it would have seemed to me to carry less weight i should have been thrown back again into uncertainty this too just at the moment when a principle a conviction had become no less a practical than a subjective need to me for thanks to you i saw a new hope in life the possibility of an active career which would give scope to all my energies do you follow me do i make myself clear perfectly replied constance with a slight inclination of her head she seemed both to listen and to be absorbed in thought from that moment i ceased to think of the book i had as good as forgotten its existence though on the whole it had done me so great a service there were many things in it i didn't like and these would now have annoyed me much more than at the first reading i should have felt as if the man had got hold of my philosophy and presented it imperfectly you will understand now why i was so astonished at your charge of plagiarism i really didn't know what to say i couldn't perceive your point of view i don't remember how i replied i'm afraid my behaviour seemed only to confirm your suspicion in very truth it was the result of genuine surprise of course i had only to reflect to see how this discovery must have come upon you but then it was too late we were in the thick of extraordinary complications no hope of quiet and reasonable talk since the tragic end i have worried constantly about that misunderstanding is it quite cleared up we must be frank with each other now or never speak your thought as honestly as i have spoken mine i completely understand you was the meditative reply i was sure you would to some people such an explanation would be useless mrs toplady for instance i should be sorry to have to justify myself by psychological reasoning to mrs toplady and remember mrs toplady represents the world a wise man does not try to explain himself to the world enough if by exceptional good luck there is one person to whom he can confidently talk of his struggles and his purposes don't suppose however that i lay claim to any great wisdom after the last fortnight that would be rather laughable but i am capable of benefiting by experience and very few men can truly say as much it is on the practical side that i have hitherto been most deficient i see my way to correcting that fault nothing could be better for me just now than electioneering work it will take me out of myself and give a rest to the speculative side of my mind don't you agree with me quite there's another thing i must make clear to you dyce pursued now swimming delightedly on the flood of his own eloquence for a long time i seriously doubted whether i was fit for a political career my ambition always tended that way but my conscience went against it i used to regard politics with a good deal of contempt you remember our old talks at alverholme constance nodded in one respect i am still of the same opinion most men who go in for a parliamentary career regard it either as a business by which they and their friends are to profit or as an easy way of gratifying their personal vanity and social ambitions that of course is why we are so far from ideal government i used to think that the man in earnest should hold aloof from parliament 
and work in more hopeful ways by literature for instance but i see now that the fact of the degradation of parliament is the very reason why a man thinking as i do should try to get into the house of commons if all serious minds hold aloof what will the government of the country sink to the house of commons is becoming in the worst sense democratic it represents above all newly acquired wealth and wealth which has no sense of its responsibilities the representative system can only be restored to dignity and usefulness by the growth of a new liberalism what i understand by that you already know one of its principles that which for the present must be most insisted upon is the right use of money irresponsible riches threaten to ruin our civilization what we have first of all to do is to form the nucleus of a party which represents money as a civilizing instead of a corrupting power he looked into constance's eyes and she smiling as if at a distant object met his look steadily i have been working out this thought he continued with vigorous accent i see it now as my guiding principle in the narrower sense the line along which i must pursue the greater ends the possession of money commonly says very little for a man's moral and intellectual worth but there is the minority of well-to-do people who have the will to use their means rightly if only they knew how this minority must be organized it must attract intellect and moral force from every social rank money must be used against money and in this struggle it is not the big battalions which will prevail personally i care very little for wealth as i think you know i have no expensive tastes i can live without luxuries oh i like to be comfortable and to be free from anxiety who doesn't but i never felt the impulse to strive to enrich myself on the other hand money as a civilizing force has great value in my eyes without it one can work indeed but with what slow results it is time to be up and doing we must organize our party get our new liberalism to work in this also do you agree with me it is certain constance replied that the right use of money is one of the great questions of our day i know how much you have thought of it said dyce then after a short pause he added in his frankest tone and it concerns you especially it does do you feel he softened his voice to respectful intimacy that in devoting yourself to this cause you will be faithful to the trusts you have accepted constance answered deliberately it depends upon what you understand by devoting myself beyond a doubt lady ogram would have approved the idea as you put it and would she not have given me her confidence as its representative asked dyce smiling up to a certain point lady ogram desired for instance to bear the expenses of your contest at hollingford and i should like to carry out her wish in the matter a misgiving began to trouble lashmar's sanguine mood he searched his companion's face it seemed to him to have grown more emphatic in expression there was a certain hardness about the lips which he had not yet observed still constance looked friendly and her eyes supported his glance thank you he murmured with some feeling and if by chance i should be beaten you wouldn't lose courage we must remember you have asked me many questions constance interrupted quietly let me use the privilege of frankness which we grant each other and ask you one in turn your private means are sufficient for the career upon which you are entering my private means he gazed at her as if he did not understand the smile fading from his lips forgive me if you think i am going too far not at all dyce exclaimed eagerly it is a question you have a perfect right to ask but i thought you knew i had no private means no i wasn't aware of that constance replied in a voice of studious civility then how do you propose their eyes encountered constance did not for an instant lose her self-command lashmar's efforts to be calm only made his embarrassment more obvious i had a small allowance from my father till lately he said but that has come to an end it never occurred to me that you misunderstood my position surely i have more than once hinted to you how poor i was i had no intention of misleading you lady ogram certainly knew she knew you were not wealthy but she thought you had a competence i told her so when she questioned me it was a mistake i see but a very natural one does it matter now asked dyce his lips again curling amiably i should suppose it mattered much how shall you live 
let us understand each other do you withdraw your consent to lady ogram's last wish that wish as you see was founded on a misunderstanding but exclaimed lashmar you are not speaking seriously quite lady ogram certainly never intended the money she had left in trust to me to be used for your private needs reflect a moment and you will see how impossible it would be for me to apply the money in such a way reflection said dyce with unnatural quietness would only increase my astonishment at your ingenuity it would have been much simpler and better to say at once that you had changed your mind can you for a moment expect me to believe that this argument really justifies you in breaking your promise i assure you replied constance also in a soft undertone it is much sounder reasoning than that by which you excuse your philosophical plagiarism lashmar's eyes wandered they fell upon the marble bust its disdainful smile seemed to him more pronounced than ever then he cried on an impulse of desperation you really mean to take lady ogram's money and to disregard the very condition on which she left it to you you forget that her will was made before she had heard your name he sat in silence a gloomy resentment lowering on his features after a glance at him constance began to speak in a calm reasonable voice it is my turn to confess i too seem to myself to have been living in a sort of dream and my awaking is no less decisive than yours at your instigation i behaved dishonestly i am very much ashamed of the recollection happily i see my way to atone for the follies and worse that i committed i can carry out lady ogram's wishes the wishes she formed while still in her sound mind and to that i shall devote my life do you intend then to apply none of this money to your personal use do you mean to earn your own living still that would defeat lady ogram's purpose was the calm answer i shall live where and how it seems good to me guided always by the intention which i know was in her mind dyce sat with his head bent forward his hands grasping his knees after what seemed to be profound reflection he said gravely this is how you think to-day i won't be so unjust to you as to take it for your final reply yet that's what it is answered constance you think so the sudden possession of wealth has disturbed your mind if i took you at your word he spoke with measured accent i should be guilty of behaviour much more dishonourable than that of which you accuse me i can wait he smiled with a certain severity it is my duty to wait until you have recovered your natural way of thinking constance was looking at him her eyes full of wonder and amusement thank you she said you are very kind very considerate but suppose you reflect for a moment on your theory of the equality of man and woman doesn't it suggest an explanation of what you call my disordered state of mind let us use plain words you want money for your career and as the need is pressing you are willing to take the encumbrance of a wife i am to feel myself honoured by your acceptance of me to subject myself entirely to your purposes to think it a glorious reward if i can aid your ambition is there much equality in this arrangement you put things in the meanest light protested lashmar what i offer you is a share in all my thoughts a companionship in whatever i do or become i have no exaggerated sense of my own powers but this i know that with fair opportunity i can attain distinction if i thought of you as in any sense an encumbrance i shouldn't dream of asking you to marry me it would defeat the object of my life i have always seen in you just the kind of woman who would understand me and help me my vanity will grant you that replied constance but for the moment i want you to inquire whether you are the kind of man who would understand and help me you are surprised that's quite a new way of putting the matter isn't it you never saw that as a result of your theory stay dyce raised his hand i know perfectly well that you are ambitious if you were not we should never have become friends but you must remember that from my point of view i am offering you such a chance of gratifying your ambition as you will hardly find again that is to say the reflection of your glory as a woman what more can i ask you can't think how this amuses me now that i have come to my senses putting aside the question of whether you are likely to win glory at all 
have you no suspicion of your delightful arrogance i should like to know how far your contempt of women really goes it went far enough at all events to make you think that i believed your talk about equality of the sexes but really i'm not quite such a simpleton i always knew that you despised women that you looked upon them as creatures to be made use of if you ask why then did i endure you for a moment the answer must be that i am a woman you see mr lashmar we females of the human species are complex some of us think and act very foolishly and all the time somewhere in our curious minds are dolefully aware of our foolishness you knew that of men let me assure you that women share the unhappy privilege lashmar was listening with knitted brows no word came to his lips you interest me pursued constance i think you are rather a typical man of our time and it isn't at all impossible that you may become as you say distinguished but clothed and in my right mind i don't feel disposed to pay the needful price for the honour of helping you on you mustn't lose heart i have little doubt that some other woman will grasp at the opportunity you so kindly wish to reserve for me but may i venture a word of counsel don't let it be a woman who holds the equality theory i say this in the interest of your peace and happiness there are plenty of women still who like to be despised and some of them are very nice indeed they are the only good wives i feel sure of it we others women cursed with brains are not meant for marriage we grow in numbers unfortunately what would be the end of it i don't know some day you will thank your stars that you did not marry a woman capable of understanding you dyce stood up and took a few steps about the floor his eyes fixed on the marble bust when can i see you again he asked abruptly i shall be going to london in a day or two i don't think we will meet again until your circumstances are better can you give me any idea of what the election expenses will be not yet dyce answered in an undertone you are going to london will you tell me what you mean to do to pursue my career your career that surprises you of course it never occurred to you that i also might have a career in view yet i have let us enter upon a friendly competition five years hence which of us will be better known i see remarked dyce his lip curling you will use your money to make yourself talked about not primarily but it is very likely that that will result from my work it offends your sense of what is becoming in a woman it throws light upon what you have been saying so i meant you will see when you think about it that i am acting strangely like a male creature we females with minds have a way of doing that i'll say more for i really want you to understand me the sudden possession of wealth has not as you suppose turned my head but it has given my thoughts a most salutary shaking and made me feel twice the woman that i was at this moment i should as soon think of taking a place as kitchen-maid as of becoming any man's wife i am free and have power to assert myself the first desire let me assure you of modern woman no less than of modern man that i shall assert myself for the good of others is a peculiarity of mine a result of my special abilities i take no credit for it some day we shall meet again and talk over our experiences for the present let us be content with corresponding now and then you shall have my address as soon as i am settled she rose and lashmar gazed at her he saw that she was as little to be moved by an appeal by an argument as the marble bust behind her i suppose he said you will appear on platforms oh dear no constance replied with a laugh my ambition doesn't take that form i leave that to you who are much more eloquent how you have altered he kept gazing at her with a certain awe i hardly know you i doubt whether you know me at all never mind she held out her hand we may be friends yet when you have come to understand that you are not so very very much my superior end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of our friend the charlatan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our friend the charlatan 
by george gissing chapter twenty seven lashmar walked back to hollingford and reached the hotel without any consciousness of the road by which he had come he felt as tired as if he had been walking all day when he had dropped into an easy chair he let his arms hang and with head drooping forward stared at his feet stretched out before him the posture suggested a man half overcome with drink he had a private meeting to attend to-night should he attend it or not his situation had become farcical was it not his plain duty to withdraw at once from the political contest that a serious candidate might as soon as possible take his place where could he discern even the glimmer of a hope in this sudden darkness his heart was heavy and cold he went through the business of the evening talking automatically seeing and hearing as in a dream he had no longer the slightest faith in his electioneering prospects and wondered how he could ever have been sanguine about them of course the conservative would win breakspeare knew it every member of the committee knew it they pretended to hope because the contest amused and occupied them no liberal had a chance at hollingford to-morrow he would throw the thing up and disappear never in his life had he passed such a miserable night at each waking from hag-ridden slumbers the blackest despondency beset him once or twice his tortured brain even glanced towards suicide temptation lurking in the assurance that by destroying himself he would become for a few days at all events the subject of universal interest he found no encouragement even in the thought of iris woolstan not only had he deeply offended her by his engagement to constance bride but almost certainly she would hear from her friend mrs toplady the whole truth of his disaster which put him beyond hope of pardon he owed her money with what face even if she did not know the worst could he go to her and ask for another loan in vain did he remember the many proofs he had received of mrs woolstan's devotion since the interview with constance all belief in himself was at an end he had thought his eloquence his personal magnetism irresistible constance had shown him the extent of his delusion if he saw iris the result would be the same at moments so profound was his feeling of insignificance that he hid his face even from the darkness and groaned not only had he lost faith in himself there remained to him no conviction no trust no hope of any kind intellectually morally he had no support shams insincerities downright dishonesties had clothed him about and these were now all stripped away leaving the thing he called his soul to quiver in shamed nakedness he knew nothing he believed nothing but death still made him fearful with the first gleam of daylight he flung himself out of his hot uncomfortable bed and hastened to be a clothed mortal once more he felt better as soon as he had dressed himself and opened the window the night with its terrible hauntings was a thing gone by at breakfast he thought fixedly of iris woolstan perhaps iris had not seen mrs toplady yet perhaps at heart she was not so utterly estranged from him as he feared something of his old power over her might even now be recovered it was the resource of desperation he must try it the waiter's usual respect seemed this morning covert mockery the viands had no savour only the draught of coffee that soothed his throat was good he had a headache and a tremor of the nerves 
in any case it would have been impossible to get through the day in the usual manner and his relief when he found himself at the railway station was almost a return of good spirits on reaching london he made straight for west hampstead as he approached mrs woolstan's house his heart beat violently without even a glance at the windows he rang the visitor's bell it sounded distinctly but there came no response he rang again and again listened to the far-off tinkling only then did he perceive that the blinds at the lower windows were drawn the house was vacant paralyzed for a moment he stared about as if in search of some one who could give him information then with sweat on his forehead he stepped up to the next door and asked if anything was known of mrs woolstan he learnt only that she had been absent for about ten days where she was the servant with whom he spoke could not tell him were the other neighbours likely to know he asked encouraged by a bare possibility he inquired at the house beyond but in vain fate was against him he might as well go home and write a letter to his committee at hollingford stay could he not remember the school to which leonard woolstan had been sent yes it was noted in his pocket-book for he had promised to write to the boy he sought the nearest post-office and dispatched a telegram to leonard please let me know immediately your mother's present address the reply was to be sent to his rooms in devonshire street and thither he straightway betook himself hoping that in an hour or so he would have news an extempore lunch was put before him never had he satisfied his hunger with less gusto time went on the afternoon brought him no telegram at seven o'clock he lay on his sofa exhausted by nervous strain anticipating a hideous night again his thoughts had turned to suicide it would be easier to obtain poison here than at hollingford laudanum death under laudanum must be very easy mere falling asleep in a sort of intoxication but he must leave behind him something in writing something which would excite attention when it appeared in all the newspapers addressed to the coroner no to his committee he would hint to them of a tragic story of noble powers and ambitions frustrated by the sordid difficulties of life the very truth let malice say what it would at his age with his brain and heart to perish thus for want of a little money as he dwelt on the infinite pathos of the thing tears well to his eyes trickled over his cheek of a sudden he started up and shouted come in yes it was a telegram he took it from the servant's hand with an exclamation of joy leonard informed him that mrs woolstan was staying at gorleston near yarmouth her address sunrise terrace he clutched at a railway guide too late to get to yarmouth to-night but that did not matter sunrise terrace in his sorry state of mind a name of such good omen brought him infinite comfort he rushed out of the house and walked at a great rate impelled by the joy of feeling himself alive once more sunrise iris woolstan would save him already he warmed with gratitude to her he thought of her with a tender kindness she might be richer than he supposed at all events she was in circumstances which would allow him to live independently and was she not just the kind of woman constance bride had advised him to marry advice given in scorn but his conscience told him thoroughly sound a nice gentle sufficiently intelligent little woman pity that there was the boy but he would always be at school suppose she had only four or five hundred a year oh probably more than that seeing that she could economize such substantial sums he was saved the sum would rise for him literally and in metaphor a rainy morning saw him at liverpool street the squalid roofs of north-east london dripped miserably under a leaden sky 
not till the train reached the borders of suffolk did a glint of sun fall upon meadow and stream thence onwards the heavens brightened the risen clouds gleamed above a shining shore lashmar did not love this part of england and he wondered why mrs woolstan had chosen such a retreat but in the lightness of his heart he saw only pleasant things arrived at yarmouth he jumped into a cab and was driven along the dull flat road which leads to gorleston odour of the brine made amends for miles of lodgings for brakes laden with boisterous trippers for tram cars and piano organs here at length was sunrise terrace a little row of plain houses on the top of the cliff with sea horizon vast before it and soft green meadowland far as one could see behind bidding his driver wait lashmar knocked at the door and stood tremulous it was half-past twelve iris might or might not have returned from her morning walk he prepared for a brief disappointment but worse awaited him mrs woolstan he learnt would not be at home for the midday meal she was with friends who had a house at gorleston where is the house he asked impatiently stamping as if his feet were cold the woman pointed his way who are the people what is their name he heard it but it conveyed nothing to him after a moment's reflection he decided to go to the hotel and there write a note whilst he was having lunch the reply came a dry missive saying that if he would call at three o'clock mrs woolstan would have much pleasure in presenting him to her friends the barkers with whom she was spending the day lashmar fumed but obeyed the invitation in a garden on the edge of the cliff he found half a dozen persons an elderly man who looked like a retired tradesman his wife of suitable appearance their son their two daughters and iris woolstan loud and mirthful talk was going on his arrival interrupted it only for a moment so glad to see you was mrs woolstan's friendly but not cordial greeting i didn't know you ever came to the east coast introductions were carelessly made he seated himself on a camp-stool by one of the young ladies and dropped a few insignificant remarks no one paid much attention to him seventy-five runs exclaimed mrs woolstan addressing herself as though with keen interest to the son of the family a high-coloured large-limbed young man of about lashmar's age that was splendid but you did better still against east croydon didn't you made my sentry there answered mr barker jerking out a leg in self-satisfaction how conceited you're making him mrs woolstan cried one of his sisters with a shrill laugh it's a rule in this house to put the stopper on jim when he begins to talk about cricket if we didn't there'd be no living with him are you a cricketer mr mr lasher asked mater familius eyeing the visitor curiously it's a long time since i played was the reply uttered with scarcely veiled contempt mrs woolstan talked on in the highest spirits exhibiting her intimacy with the barker household and her sympathy with their concerns lashmar waited for her to question him about hollingford to give him an opportunity of revealing his importance but her thoughts seemed never to turn in that direction as soon as a movement in the company enabled him to rise he stepped up to her and said in a voice audible to those standing by i want to speak to you about leonard shall you be at home this evening iris gave him a startled look you haven't bad news of len oh no nothing of the kind can you call at six o'clock he looked into her eyes and nodded what do you say to a boat mrs woolstan shouted barker the son this suggestion was acclaimed and lashmar was urged to join the party but he gladly seized this chance of escape wandering along the grassy edge of the cliffs he presently described the barkers and their friend putting forth in two little boats the sight exasperated him he strode gloomily on ever and again turning his head to watch the boats and struggling against the fears that once more assailed him in a hollow of dry sand where the cliffs broke he flung himself down and lay still for an hour or two below him on the edge of the tide children were playing he watched them sullenly lashmar disliked children the sound of their voices was disagreeable to him he wondered whether he would ever have children of his own and heartily hoped not 
six o'clock seemed very long in coming but at length he found himself at sunrise terrace again and was admitted to an ordinary lodging-house parlour where with tea on the table mrs woolstan awaited him the sea air had evidently done her good she looked younger and prettier than when dyce last saw her and the tea-gown she wore became her well how did you know where i was she began by asking rather distantly lashmar told her in detail but why were you so anxious to see me sugar i think it's a long story he replied looking at her from under his eyebrows and i don't much care for telling it in a place like this where all we can say be heard by any one on the other side of the door iris was watching his countenance the cold politeness with which she had received him had become a very transparent mask beneath it showed eager curiosity and trembling hope we can go out if you like she said and most likely meet those singular friends of yours who on earth are they very nice people replied mrs woolstan holding up her head they are intolerably vulgar and you must be aware of it i felt ashamed to see you among them what are you doing at a place like this why have you shut up your house really exclaimed iris with a flutter that is my business lashmar's nervous irritation was at once subdued he looked timidly at the indignant face let his eyes fall and murmured an apology i've been going through strange things and i'm not quite master of myself the night before last his voice sunk to a hollow note i very nearly took poison what do you mean poison mrs woolstan's eyes widened in horror lashmar regarded her with a smile of intense melancholy one thing only kept me from it i remembered that i was in your debt and i felt it would be too cowardly what has happened come and sit near the window no one can hear us talking here i have been expecting to read of your election is it something to do with lady ogram's death i have wanted so much to know about that and how it affected you a few questions gave dyce the comfortable assurance that iris had not seen mrs toplady for a long time trouble with servants she said coming after a slight illness had decided her to quit her house for the rest of the summer and the barkers persuaded her to come to gorleston when leonard left school for his holidays she meant to go with him to some nice place but do tell me what you mean by those dreadful words and why have you come to see me she was her old self the iris woolstan on whom first of all lashmar had tried his method who had so devoutly believed in him and given such substantial proof of her faith the man felt his power and began to recover self-respect tell me one thing he said bending towards her may i remain your debtor for a little longer will it put you to inconvenience not at all was the impulsive reply i told you i didn't want the money i have more than six hundred pounds a year and never spend quite all of it lashmar durst not raise his eyes lest a gleam of joy should betray him he knew now what he had so long desired to know six hundred a year it was enough you are very kind that relieves me for two or three days i have been in despair yes you shall hear all about it i owe you the whole truth for no one ever understood me as you did and no one ever gave me such help of every kind first of all about my engagement to miss bride it's at an end but more than that it wasn't a real engagement at all we tried to play a comedy and the end has been tragic iris drew a deep breath of wonder her little lips were parted her little eyebrows made a high arch she had the face of a child who listens to a strange and half terrifying story don't you see how it was he exclaimed in a subdued voice of melodious sadness lady ogram discovered that her niece you remember may tomalin thought rather too well of me this did not suit her views she had planned a marriage between may and lord dymchurch you know what her temper was one day she gave me the choice either i married constance bride or i never entered her house again imagine my position think of me with my ambitions my pride and the debt i had incurred to you can you blame me much if seeing that lady ogram's life might end any day i met her tyranny by stratagem how i longed to tell you the truth but i felt bound in honour to silence constance bride my friend and never anything more agreed to the pretence of an engagement wasn't it brave of her and so things went on until the day when dymchurch came down to rivenoak and proposed to may the silly girl refused him there was a terrible scene such as i hope never to behold again may was driven forth from the house and lady ogram just as she was bidding me 
take steps for my immediate marriage fell to the ground unconscious dying he paused impressively the listener was panting as if she had run a race and the will she asked it dates from a year ago may tomlin is not mentioned in it i of course have nothing iris gazed at the floor a little sound as of consternation had passed her lips but she made no attempt to console the victim of destiny who sat with bowed head before her after a brief silence lashmar told of the will as it concerned constance bride insisting on the fact that she was a mere trustee of the wealth bequeathed to her with a humorously doleful smile he spoke of lady ogram's promise to defray his election expenses and added that miss bride in virtue of her trusteeship would carry out this wish another exclamation sounded from the listener this time one of joy well that's something i suppose the expenses are heavy aren't they oh not very but what's the use of course i withdraw he let his hand fall despondently again there was silence and that is why you thought of taking poison asked iris with a quick glance at his lowering visage isn't it a good reason all is over with me if lady ogram had lived to make her new will i should have been provided for now i am penniless and hopeless but if she had lived you would have had to marry miss bride dyce made a sorrowful gesture no she would never have consented even if i could have brought myself to such a sacrifice in any case i was doomed but iris paused biting her lip you were going to say only that i suppose you would have been willing to marry that girl the niece i will answer you frankly he spoke in the softest tone and his look had a touching candour you better than any one know the nature of my ambition you know it is not merely personal one doesn't like to talk grandiloquently but alone with you there is no harm in saying that i have a message for our time we have reached a point in social and political evolution where all the advance of modern life seems to be imperiled by the growing preponderance of the multitude our need is of men who are born to guide and rule and i feel myself one of these but what can i do as long as i am penniless and so i answer you frankly yes if may tomlin had inherited lady ogram's wealth i should have felt it my duty to marry her iris listened without a smile lashmar had never spoken with a more convincing show of earnestness what is she going to do asked the troubled little woman her eyes cast down dyce told all that he knew of may's position he was then questioned as to the state of things political at hollingford his replies were at once sanguine and disconsolate well he said at length i have done my best but fortune is against me in coming to see you i discharge what i felt to be a duty let me again thank you for your generous kindness now i must work work he stood an image of noble sadness of magnanimity at issue with cruel fate iris glanced timidly at him her panting showed that she wished to speak but could not he offered his hand iris took it but only for an instant i want you to tell me something else broke from her lips i will tell you anything are you in love with that girl miss tomlin with sorrowful dignity he shook his head with proud self-consciousness he smiled nor with miss bride i think of her exactly as if she were a man if i told you that i very much wished you to do something would you care to do it your wish is for me a command dyce answered gently if it were not i should be grossly ungrateful then promise to go through with the election your expenses are provided for if you win i am sure some way can be found of providing you with an income i am sure it can it shall be as you wish said lashmar seeming to speak with a resolute cheerfulness i will return to hollingford by the first train to-morrow they talked for a few minutes more lashmar mentioned where he was going to pass the night he promised to resume their long interrupted correspondence and to let his friend have frequent reports from hollingford then they shook hands and parted silently after dinner dyce strayed shorewards he walked down to the little harbour and out on to the jetty a clouded sky had brought night fast upon sunset green and red lamps shone from the lighthouse at the jetty head and the wash of the rising tide sounded in darkness on either hand not many people had chosen this spot for their evening walk but as he drew near to the lighthouse he saw the figure of a woman against the grey obscurity she was watching a steamboat slowly making its way through the harbour mouth he advanced and at the sound of his nearing step 
the figure faced to him there was just light enough to enable him to recognize iris you oughtn't to be here alone he said oh why not she replied with a laugh i'm old enough to take care of myself the wind had begun to moan waves tide-borne against the jetty made a hollow booming and at moments scattered spray how black it is to-night iris added it will rain there i felt a spot only a splash of sea-water i think replied lashmar standing close beside her both gazed at the dark vast of sea and sky a pair of ramblers approached them a young man and a girl talking loudly the tongue of lower london i know a young lady sounded in the feminine voice as as a keeper set with a diamond and a hamethyst lovely come away said dyce what a hateful place this is how can you bear to be among such brutes iris moved on by him but said nothing i felt ashamed he added to find you with people like the barkers do you mean to say they don't disgust you they are not so bad as that iris weakly protested but you mustn't think i regard them as intimate friends it's only that i've been rather lonely lately lan away at school and several things yes yes i understand but they're no company for you do get away as soon as possible another couple went by them talking loudly the same vernacular if i put a book down for a day said the young woman i forget all i've read i've a hawful bad memory for readin how i loathe that class lashmar exclaimed i never came to this part of the coast because i knew it was defiled by them for heaven's sake get away go to some place where your ears won't be perpetually outraged i can't bear to think of leaving you here i'll go as soon as ever i can i promise you murmured iris there it really is beginning to rain we must walk quickly will you take my arm she did so and they hurried on that's the democracy said lashmar those are the people for whom we are told that the world exists they get money and it gives them power meanwhile the true leaders of mankind as often as not struggle through their lives in poverty and neglect iris's voice sounded timidly you would feel it of no use to have just enough for independence for the present he replied it would be all i ask but i might just as well ask for ten thousand a year the rain was beating upon them during the ascent to sunrise terrace neither spoke a word at the door of her lodgings iris looked into her companion's face and said in a tremulous voice i am sure you will be elected i am certain of it dyce laughed pressed her hand and as the door opened walked away through the storm End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of our friend the charlatan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our friend the charlatan by george gissing chapter twenty eight lord dymchurch went down into somerset his younger sister was in a worse state of health than he had been led to suppose there could be no thought of removing her from home a day or two later her malady took a hopeless turn and by the end of the week she was dead a month after this the surviving daughter of the house seeking solace in the ancient faith to which she had long inclined joined a religious community dymchurch was left alone since his abrupt departure from rivenoak he had lived a silent life spending the greater part of every day in solitude grief was not sufficient to account for the heaviness and muteness which had fallen upon him or for the sudden change by which his youthful-looking countenance had become that of a middle-aged man he seemed to shrink before eyes that regarded him however kind their expression one might have thought that some secret shame was harassing his mind he himself indeed would have used no other word to describe the ill under which he suffered looking back on that strange episode of his life which began with his introduction to mrs toplady and ended in the park at rivenoak he was stung almost beyond endurance by a sense of ignominious folly 
on his lonely walks and in the silence of sleepless nights he often gesticulated and groaned like a man in pain his nerves became so shaken that at times he could hardly raise a glass or cup to his lips without spilling the contents poverty and loneliness he had known and had learnt to bear them with equanimity for the first time he was tasting humiliation incessantly he reviewed the stages of his foolishness and as he deemed it of his dishonour but he had lost the power to understand that phantasm of himself which pranked so grotesquely in the retrospect was it true that he had reasoned and taken deliberate step after step in the wooing of lady ogram's niece might he not urge in his excuse to cloak him from his own and the world's contempt some unsuspected calenture for which had he known he ought to have taken medical advice when in self-chastisement he tried to summon before his mind's eye the image of may tomlin he found it quite impossible the face no longer existed for him the voice was as utterly forgotten as any he might have chanced to hear for a few minutes on that fatal evening in pont street and this was what he had seen as an object of romantic tenderness this vaporous nothing this glimmer in a dazed eye calm moments brought a saner self-reproach i simply yielded to the common man's common temptation i am poor and it was wealth that dazzled and lured me pride would explain more subtly that is but a new ground of shame i felt a prey to the vulgarest and basest passion better to burn that truth into my mind and to make the brand a lifelong warning i shall the sooner lift up my head again he seemed to palliate his act by remembering that he wished to benefit his sisters neither of them the poor dead girl and she who lived only for self-forgetfulness would have been happier at the cost of his disgrace how well it was indeed that he had been saved from that debasement in their eyes he lived on in the silent house quite alone and desiring no companionship few letters came for him and he rarely saw a newspaper after a while he was able to forget himself in the reading of books which tranquillized his thought and held him far from the noises of the passing world so sequestered was the grey old house that he could go forth when he chose into lanes and meadows without fear of encountering any one who would disturb his meditation and his enjoyment of nature's beauty through the mellow days of the declining summer he lived amid trees and flowers slowly recovering health and peace in places where birds note or the ripple of a stream or the sighing of the wind were the only sounds under the ever-changing sky his thoughts were often of death but not on that account gloomy reading in his marcus aurelius he said to himself that the stoic emperor must after all have regarded death with some fear else why speak of it so persistently and with such marshalling of arguments to prove it no matter for dread dymchurch never wished to shorten his life yet without other logic than that of a quiet heart came to think more than resignedly of the end towards which he moved he was the last of his family and no child would ever bear his name without bitterness he approved this extinction of a line which seemed to have outlived its natural energies he at all events would bear no responsibility for suffering or wrong-doing in the days to come the things which had so much occupied him during the last year or two the state of the time its perils and its needs were now but seldom in his mind he felt himself ripening to that wise passiveness which through all his intellectual disquiet he had regarded as the unattainable ideal when as a very young man he exercised himself in versifying the model he more or less consciously kept in view was matthew arnold it amused him now to recall certain of the compositions he had once been rather proud of and to recognize how closely he had trodden in arnold's footprints at the same time he felt glad that the aspiration of his youth seemed likely to become the settled principle of his maturity 
and nowadays he gave much of his thought to wordsworth content to study without the desire of imitating whether he could do anything whether he could bear witness in any open way to what he held the truth must still remain uncertain sure it was that a profound distrust of himself in every practical direction a very humble sense of follies committed and dangers barely escaped would for a long time make him a silent and solitary man he hoped that some way might be shown him some modest yet clear way by following which he would live not wholly to himself but he had done for ever with schemes of social regeneration with political theories with all high-sounding words and phrases it might well prove that the work appointed him was simply to live as an honest man was that so easy or such a little thing walking one day a mile or two from home in one of those high bowered somerset lanes which are unsurpassed for rural loveliness he came within sight of a little cottage which stood apart from a hamlet hidden beyond a near turning of the road before it moved a man white-headed back-bent so crippled by some ailment that he tottered slowly and painfully with the aid of two sticks just as dimchurch drew near the old fellow accidentally let fall his pipe which he had been smoking as he hobbled along for him this incident was a disaster he stared down helplessly at the pipe and the little curl of smoke which rose from it utterly unable to stoop for its recovery dimchurch seeing the state of things at once stepped to his assistance i thank you sir i thank you said the hobbler with pleasant frankness a man isn't much use when he can't even keep his pipe in his mouth to say nothing of picking it up when it drops what do you think sir dimchurch talked with him the man had spent his life as a gardener and now for a couple of years invalided by age and rheumatism had lived in this cottage on a pension his daughter a widow dwelt with him but was away working nearly the whole of the day he got along very well but one thing there was that grieved him the state of his little garden through the early summer he had been able to look after it as usual pottering among the flowers and the vegetables for an hour or two each day but there came rainy weather and with it one of his attacks and the garden was now so overgrown with weeds that it hurt his eyes it really did to look that way the daughter dug potatoes and gathered beans as they were wanted but she had neither time nor strength to do more interested in a difficulty such as he had never imagined dimchurch went up to the garden wall and viewed the state of things indeed it was deplorable thistles docks nettles wild growths innumerable were choking the flowers in which the old man so delighted but the garden was such a small one that little trouble and time would be needed to put it in order will you let me do it for you he asked good-naturedly it's just the kind of job i should like you sir cried the old fellow all but again losing his pipe in astonishment ho ho that's a joke indeed without another word jim church opened the wicket flung off his coat and got to work he laboured for more than an hour the old man leaning on the wall and regarding him with half ashamed half amused countenance they did not talk much but when he had begun to perspire freely dimchurch looked at his companion and said now here's a thing i never thought of neglect your garden for a few weeks and it becomes a wilderness nature conquers it back again think what that means how all the cultivated places of the earth are kept for men only by ceaseless fighting with nature year in year out and that's true sir that's true i've thought of it sometimes but then i'm a gardener you see and it's my business as you may say to have such thoughts it's every man's business returned dimchurch supporting himself on his hoe and viewing the uprooted weeds i never realized as in this half hour at the cost of what incessant labour the earth is kept at man's service if i have done you a good turn you have done me a better and he hoed vigorously at a root of dandelion not for years had he felt so well in body and mind as during his walk home there there was the thought for which he had been obscurely groping what were volumes of metaphysics and of sociology to the man who had heard this one little truth whispered from the upturned mould henceforth he knew why he was living and how it behooved him to live let theories and poesies follow if they would for him the prime duty was that nearest to him to strive his best at the little corner of earth which he called his own 
should yield food for man at this moment there lay upon his table letters informing him of the unsatisfactory state of his kentish farm the tenant was doing badly in every sense of the word and would willingly escape from his lease if opportunity were given very well the man should go i will live there myself i will get some practical man to live with me until i understand farming for profit i don't care all will be well if i keep myself alive and furnish food for a certain number of other mortals this is the work ready to my hand no preaching no theorizing no trying to prove that the earth should be parcelled out and every man turn delver i will cultivate this ground because it is mine and because no other way offers of living as a man should taking some part however humble in the eternal strife with nature the idea had before now suggested itself to him but not as the result of a living conviction if he had then turned to farming it would have been as an experiment in life more or less vague reflections on the needs of the time would have seemed to justify him now he was indifferent to all questions save that prime solicitude of the human race how to hold its own against the hostile forces everywhere leagued against it life was a perpetual struggle and let dreamers say what they might could never be anything else he for one perceived no right that he had to claim exemption from the doom of labour had he felt an impulse to any other kind of work well and good he would have turned to it but nothing whatever called to him with imperative voice save this task of tilling his own acres it might not always satisfy him he took no vow of one sole vocation he had no desire to let his mind rust whilst his hands grew horny enough that for the present he had an aim which he saw as a reality on his return home he found a london letter awaiting him it was with a nervous shrug that he saw the writing of mrs toplady addressing him at his club she invited him to dine on an evening a fortnight hence if he chanced to be in town you heard of course she added of the defeat of mr lashmar at hollingford it seems to have been inevitable so lashmar had been defeated the hollingford election interested dymchurch so little that he had never inquired as to its result in truth he had forgotten all about it i fear mr lashmar is rather disappointing rumour says that the philosophical theory of life and government which he put before us as original was taken word for word from a french book which he took for granted no one would have read i hope this is not true it has a very unpleasant sound quite as unpleasant thought dymchurch was mrs toplady's zeal in spreading the rumour he found no difficulty in crediting it the biosociological theory had occupied his thoughts for a time and in reflecting upon it now he found it as plausible as any other but it had no more power to interest him lashmar perhaps was mere sophist charlatan an unscrupulous journalist who talked instead of writing words words how sick he was of the universal babble the time had taken for its motto that council of mephisto vor allem haltet uc on forte and how many of these loud talkers believed the words they uttered or had found them in their own minds and how many preachers of socialism in this that or the other form had in truth the socialistic spirit lashmar with his emphasis on the obligation of social service was he not simply an ambitious struggler and intriguer careless of everything but his own advancement probably enough and on the whole was there ever an age so rank with individualism as this of ours which chatters ceaselessly of self subdual to the common cause i too thus he thought am as much an individualist as the others if i said that i cared a rap for mankind at large i should be phrase-making only thank heaven i don't care to advertise myself i don't care to make money i ask only to be left alone and to satisfy and quiet my sense of self-respect on the morrow he was gone End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of our friend the charlatan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our friend the charlatan by george gissing chapter twenty nine when you receive this letter you will have already seen the result i knew how it would be but tried to hope because you were hoping my pole 
is better than that of the last liberal candidate but hollingford remains a tory stronghold shall i come to see you i am worn out utterly exhausted and can scarcely hold the pen perhaps a few days at the seaside would do me good but what right have i to idle if you would like me to come please wire to alverholme rectory possibly you would rather i didn't bring my gloom now you have len with you and are enjoying yourself above all be quite frank if you are too disappointed to care to see me in heaven's name say so you needn't fear its effect upon me i should be glad to have done with the world but i have duties to discharge i wish you could have heard my last speech there were good things in it you shall see my address of thanks to those who voted for me i must try to get it widely circulated for as you know it has more than local importance breakspeare good fellow says that i have a great career before me i grin and can't tell him the squalid truth there are many things i should like to speak about my brain is feverishly active i must try to rest another twenty-four hours of this strain and the results would be serious in any case wire to me yes or no if it is no i shall say so be it and begin at once to look out for some way of earning bread and cheese we shall be friends all the same mrs woolstan was at eastbourne having read lashmore's letter she brooded for a few minutes then betook herself to the post-office and telegraphed come at once a few hours later she received a telegram informing her that lashmore would reach eastbourne at eleven o'clock on the next morning at that hour she waited in her lodgings on the sea-front a cab drove up lashmore was shown into the room he looked indeed much the worse for his agitations his hand was hot he moved languidly and seemed to be too tired to utter more than a few words are you alone quite len is down on the shore and won't be back till half-past one would you mind if i lay down on the sofa of course not replied iris regarding him anxiously you're not ill i hope he took her hand and pressed it against his forehead with the most melancholy of smiles having dropped on to the couch he beckoned iris to take a chair beside him what can i get for you she asked you must have some refreshment sleep sleep he moaned musically if i could but sleep a little but i have so much to say don't fuss you know how i hate fuss no no i don't want anything i assure you but i haven't slept for a week give me your hand how glad i am to see you again so you still have faith in me you don't despise me what nonsense said iris allowing him to hold her hand against his breast as he lay motionless his eyes turned to the ceiling you must try again that's all at hollingford it was evidently hopeless yes i made a mistake if i could have stood as a conservative i should have carried all before me it was lady ogram's quarrel with rob which committed me to the other side iris was silent panting a little as if she suppressed words which had risen to her lips he turned his head to look at her of course you understand that party names haven't the least meaning for me by necessity i wear a ticket but it's a matter of total indifference to me what name it bears my object has nothing to do with party politics but for lady ogram's squabbles i should at this moment be member for hollingford but would it be possible asked iris with a flutter to call yourself a conservative next time i've been thinking about that he spoke absently his eyes still upwards it is pretty certain that the conservative side gives me more chance it enrages me to think how i should have triumphed at hollingford i could have roused the place to such enthusiasm as it never knew the great mistake of my life but what choice had i lady ogram was fatal to me he groaned and let his eyelids droop it is possible that at the general election a liberal constituency may invite me in that case of course he broke off with a weary wave of the hand but what's the use of thinking about it i must look for work do you know i have thoughts of going to new zealand oh that's nonsense try to realize my position he raised himself on his elbow after my life of the last few months will it be very enjoyable to become a subordinate to work for wages to sink into obscurity does it seem to you natural do you think i shall be able to bear it he had begun to quiver with excitement as iris kept silence he rose to a sitting position and continued more vehemently don't you understand that death would be preferable a thousand times imagine me me at the beck and call of paltry everyday people does it seem to you fitting that i should pay by such degradation for one or two trivial errors 
how shall i bear it i don't know but bear it i must i keep reminding myself that i am not a free man if once i could pay my debt oh don't talk about that exclaimed iris on a note of distress what do i care about the money no but i care about my honour cried lashmar if i had won the election all would have been different my career would have begun do you know what i should have done in that case i should have come to you and have said i am a member of parliament it is to you that i owe this more than to any one else will you do yet more for me will you be my companion in the life upon which i am entering share all my hopes help me to conquer that is what i meant to do but i am beaten and i can only ask you to have patience with your miserable debtor he let his face fall on to the head of the sofa and shook with emotion there was a short silence then iris her cheeks flushing lightly touched his hair at once he looked up gazed into her face what you still believe in me enough for that yes replied iris her eyes down and her bosom fluttering enough for that ah but be careful think he looked at her with impressive sadness your friends will tell you that you are marrying a penniless adventurer have you the courage to face all that kind of thing i know you better than my friends do replied iris taking in both her own the hand he held to her my fear she added again dropping her eyes and fluttering is that you will some day repent never never it would be the blackest ingratitude he spoke so fervently that the freckled face became rosy with joy it was so near to his that the man in him claimed warmer tribute and iris grew rosier still haven't you always loved me a little she whispered if i had only known it answered lashmar the victor's smile softened with self-reproach my ambition has much to answer for forgive me iris there's something else i must say dear she murmured after all i have so little and there is len you know why of course do you imagine i should wish to rob him no 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 she panted but it is such a small income after all i am afraid we ought to to be careful at first of course we must we shall live as simply as possible and then you mustn't suppose that i shall never earn money it's only waiting for one's opportunity a silence fell between them lashmar's amorous countenance had an undernote of thoughtfulness iris smiling blissfully none the less reflected what are you thinking of he asked gently only how happy i am i haven't the slightest fear i know you have great things before you of course we must make use of our friends may i write to mrs toplady and tell her she spoke without looking at him and so was spared the interpretation of muscular twitches certainly do you know whether she is still in london i don't know but probably not don't you think she may be very useful to us i've always found her very nice and kind and she knows such hosts of people lashmar had his own thoughts about mrs toplady but the advantage of her friendship was undeniable happily he had put it out of her power to injure him by any revelation she might make concerning may tomlin his avowal to iris that may had been undisguisedly in love with him would suffice to explain anything she might hear about the tragic comedy at rivenoak whether the lady of pont street could be depended upon for genuine goodwill was a question that must remain unsettled until he had seen her again she had bidden him to call upon her at all events and plainly it would be advisable to do so as soon as possible yes he answered reflectively she is a person to be reckoned with it's possible her advice might be worth something in the difficulty about liberal or conservative she is intelligent enough i think to understand me on that point yes you might write to her at once if i were you i would speak quite frankly you know her well enough for that don't you frankly how oh, i mean that you might say we have really been fond of each other for a long time and that well that fate has brought us together in spite of everything that kind of thing you know yes yes exclaimed iris that's just what i should like to say their talk grew calmly practical the last half hour of it was concerned with pecuniary detail her eye on the clock for leonard was sure to enter very soon mrs woolstan gave a full account of her income enumerating the securities which were in the hands of her trustee mr wrybolt and those which she had under her own control in the event of her remarriage mr wrybolt's responsibility came to an end a circumstance very pleasing to lashmar when the schoolboy interrupted them their conversation was by no means finished after cheerful lunch they resumed it on the seashore leonard being sent off to amuse himself as he would 
by tea-time it had been agreed that lashmar should at once give up his expensive london rooms and come down to eastbourne to recruit his health and enjoy iris's society until leonard went back to school the house at west hampstead should be their home for the first twelvemonth by that time they would see how things were going and be able to make plans early in the evening lashmar took a train for town at his lodgings he found several letters two of them were important constance bride's handwriting indicated the envelope to be first torn open she wrote concisely and with her usual clearness the ill news from hollingford had been a grief to her but it was very satisfactory to see that lashmar had reduced the conservative majority you have gained some very useful experience which i hope you may before long have an opportunity of using please send me a statement of the election expenses as soon as you can you remember the understanding between us in that matter i am soon leaving england for a few weeks but a letter directed as above will always reach me the address referred to was that of a well-known society for social reform in the west of london his hand tremulous with the anger which this curt epistle had excited lashmar broke an envelope on the flap of which was printed in red letters the pont street address so familiar to him mrs toplady wrote more at length she took the trouble to express her disappointment at the result of the hollingford election in courteously rounded terms our dear old friend of rivenoak would have found some apt phrase to describe such a man as butterworth wasn't she good at that kind of thing how i have laughed to hear her talk of the late lamented rob you have the satisfaction of knowing that you got more votes than any liberal has done at hollingford for many years so the papers tell me in fact you have made a very good start indeed and i am sure the eye of the party will be on you lashmar glowed he had not expected such words from mrs toplady after all iris had given him good advice who knew but this woman might be more useful to him than lady ogram had been do you care for news of miss tomalin the latter continued after spending two or three days with me she grew restless and took rooms for herself i am afraid to tell you the truth that she is a little disappointing it is perhaps quite as well that a certain romantic affair which was confided to me came to nothing a week after she left my house i received a very stiff not to say impertinent letter in which the young lady informed me that she was about to marry a mr yabsley of northampton a man to quote her words of the highest powers and with a brilliant future already assured to him this seemed to me i confess a little sudden but at least it had the merit of being amusing perhaps i may venture to hope that you are already quite consoled remember me i beg to miss bride are you likely to be in this part of the world during the holidays if anywhere near do come and see me and we will talk about that striking philosophical theory of yours lashmar bit his lip all at once he saw mrs toplady's smile and it troubled him none the less did he ponder her letter re-reading it several times presently he mused with uneasiness on the fact that iris might even now be writing to mrs toplady would her interest in him she seemed indeed to be genuinely interested survive the announcement that after all he was not going to marry constance bride but had declined upon an insignificant little widow with a few hundreds a year was not this upshot of his adventures too beggarly had mrs toplady been within easy reach he would have gone to see her but she wrote from the north of scotland he could only await the result of iris's letter to the news concerning may tomlin he gave scarcely a thought mr yabsley of northampton exceeding weariness sank him for a few hours in sleep but before dawn he was tossing again on the waves of miserable doubt why had he not waited a little before going to see iris if only he had received this letter of mrs toplady in time it would have checked him or so he thought was it the malice of fate which had ordained that on his way to eastbourne he should not have troubled to look in at his lodgings how many such wretched accidents he could recall was he instead of being fortune's favourite simply a poor devil hunted by ill luck doomed to lose every chance why not he as well as another such men abound he had not yet taken the irretrievable step until he was actually married a hope remained to him he might postpone the fatal day his purse was not yet empty why should he be too strict in the report of his election expenses to constance every pound in his pocket meant a prolongation of liberty a new horizon of the possible two days later he was back again at eastbourne he had taken a cheap little lodging and yielded himself to seaside indolence 
a week passed and iris heard from mrs toplady she did not at once show lashmar the letter she awaited a moment when he was lulled by physical comfort into a facile and sanguine humour mrs toplady must have been in a hurry when she wrote this was her remark as with seeming carelessness she produced the letter of course she has an enormous correspondence i shall hear again from her no doubt before long one side only of the note-paper was covered in formal phrase the writer said that she was glad to hear of her friend's engagement and wished her all happiness not a word about their future meeting not an allusion to lashmar's prospects if iris had announced her coming marriage with some poor clerk mrs toplady could not have written less effusively there is an end of her interest in me dyce remarked with a nervous shrug iris protested and did her best to put another aspect on the matter but without success for twenty-four hours lashmar kept away from her she offended tried to disregard his absence but at length sped to make inquiries fearful lest he should be driven to despair at the murky end of a wet evening they paced the esplanade together you don't love me said iris on a sob it is because i love you he replied glooming that i can't bear to think of you married to such a luckless fellow as i am dearest she whispered am i ruining you do you wish to be free again tell me the truth i think i can bear it the next day saw them rambling in sunshine lashmar amorous and resigned iris flutteringly hopeful and with such alternations did the holiday go by when leonard returned to school their marriage was fixed for ten days later shortly before leaving eastbourne iris had written to mr wrybolt already they had corresponded on the subject of her marriage this last letter concerning a point of business which required immediate attention remained without reply puzzled by her trustee's silence iris soon after she reached home went to see him at his city office she learnt that mr wrybolt was out of town but would certainly return in a day or two again she wrote again she waited in vain for a reply on a dull afternoon near the end of september as she sat thinking of lashmar and resolutely seeing him in the glorified aspect dear to her heart and mind the servant announced mr barker this was the athletic young man in whose company she had spent some time at gorleston before lashmar's coming his business lay in the city he knew mr wrybolt and through him had made mrs woolstan's acquaintance the face with which he entered the drawing-room portended something more than a friendly chat iris had at one time thought that this young man felt disposed to offer her marriage was that his purpose now and did it account for his odd look i want to ask you mr barker began abruptly whether you know anything about wrybolt have you heard from him lately iris replied that she herself wished to hear of that gentleman who did not answer her letters and was said to be out of town that's so is it exclaimed the young man with a yet stranger look on his face you really have no idea where he is none whatever and i particularly want to see him so do i said mr barker smiling grimly so do several people you'll excuse me i hope mrs woolstan i knew he was a friend of yours and thought you might perhaps know more about him than we did in the city i mustn't stay iris stared at him as he rose a vague alarm began to tremble in her mind you don't mean that anything's wrong she panted we'll hope not but it looks queer oh cried iris he has money of mine he is my trustee i know that please excuse me i really mustn't stay oh but tell me mr barker she clutched at his coat sleeve is my money in danger i can't say but you certainly ought to look after it get someone to make inquiries at once that's my advice i really must go he disappeared leaving iris motionless in amazement and terror End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of our friend the charlatan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our friend the charlatan by george gissing chapter thirty the wedding was to be a very quiet one lashmar would have preferred the civil ceremony at the table of the registrar with musty casuals for witnesses but iris shrank from this it must be at a church and with a few friends looking on or surely people would gossip had he been marrying an heiress dyce would have called for pomp and circumstance 
with portraits in the fashion papers and every form of advertisement which society has contrived as it was he desired to slink through the inevitable he was ashamed he was confounded and only did not declare it to the very eve of the wedding day his mind ferreted elusive hopes had men and gods utterly forsaken him in solitude he groaned and gnashed his teeth and no deliverance came reaction made him at times the fervent lover and these interludes supported iris's courage let it once be over she kept saying to herself she trusted in her love and in her womanhood at all events cried the bridegroom we needn't go through the foolery of running away to hide ourselves it's only waste of money but iris pleaded for the honeymoon people would think it so strange if they went straight from church to their home at west hampstead and would not a few autumn weeks of devon be delightful again he yielded the vicar of alverholme and his wife when satisfied that dyce's betrothed was a respectable person consented to be present at the marriage not easily did mrs lashmar digest her bitter disappointment which came so close upon that of dyce's defeat at hollingford but she was a practical woman and in the state of things at alverholme six hundred a year seemed to her not altogether to be despised my fear was she remarked one day to her husband that dyce would be tempted to marry money i respect him for the choice he has made it shows character the vicar just gave a glance of surprise but said nothing every day made him an older man in look and bearing his head was turning white he had begun to mutter to himself as he walked about the parish not a man in england who worried more about his own affairs and those of the world in an obscure lodging dyce awaited the day of destiny one evening he went to dine at west hampstead though he was rather late iris had not yet come home and she had left no message to explain her absence he waited a quarter of an hour when at length his betrothed came hurrying into the room she wore so strange a countenance that dyce could not but ask what had happened nothing nothing she declared it was only that she had been obliged to hurry so and was out of breath and and whereupon she tottered to a chair death pale all but fainting what the devil is the matter with you cried lashmar whose over-strong nerves could not endure this kind of thing his violence had an excellent effect iris recovered herself and came towards him with hands extended it's nothing at all dearest i couldn't bear to keep you waiting and fretted myself into a fever when i saw what time it was don't be angry with me will you dyce was satisfied it seemed to him a very natural explanation a caress put him into his gracious mood after all you know he said you're a very womanly woman i think we shall have to give up pretending that you're not but i've given it up long since iris exclaimed with large eyes didn't you know that i'm not sure he laughed that i'm not glad of it and they passed a much more tranquil evening than usual iris seemed tired she sat with her head on dyce's shoulder thrilling when his lips touched her hair he had assured her that her hair was beautiful that he had always admired its hue of the autumn elm leaf her face too he was beginning to find pretty and seldom did he trouble to reflect that she was seven years older than he already he regarded this house as his own his books had been transferred hither and many of his other possessions very carefully had iris put out of sight or got rid of everything which could remind him of her former marriage certain things portraits and the like which must be preserved for leonard's sake were locked away in the boy's room of course lashmar had given her no presents she on the other hand had been very busy in furnishing a study which should please him buying the pictures and ornaments he liked and many expensive books of which he said that he had need into this room dyce was not allowed to peep it waited as a surprise for him on the return from the honeymoon drawing-room and dining-room he trod as master and often felt that after all a man could be very comfortable here for a year or two a box of good cigars invited him after dinner a womanly woman the little mistress of the house and all things considered he couldn't be sure 
that he wasn't glad of it one more day only before that of the wedding dyce had been on the point of asking whether all the business with Rybolt was satisfactorily settled but delicacy withheld him really there was nothing to do iris's money simply passed into her own hands on the event of her marriage it would be time enough to talk of such things presently they spent nearly all the last day together iris was in the extremity of nervousness she looked as if she had not slept for two or three nights often she hid her face against dyce's shoulder and shook as if sobbing but no tears followed do you love me she asked again and again do you really really love me but you know i do dyce answered at length irritably how many times must i tell you it's all very well to be womanly but don't be womanish you're not sorry you're going to marry me you're getting hysterical and i can't stand that hysterical she became as soon as lashmar had left her one of the two servants looking into the dressing-room before going to bed saw her lying half on the floor half against the sofa in a lamentable state she wailed incoherent phrases i can't help it too late i can't can't help it oh oh unobserved the domestic drew back and went to gossip with her fellow-servant of this strange incident the hours drove on lashmar found himself at the church accompanied by his father his mother his old friend the home office clerk they waited the bride's coming she was five minutes late ten minutes late but came at last with her were two ladies kinsfolk of hers had iris risen from a sick-bed to go through this ceremony she could not have shown a more disconcerting visage but she held herself up before the altar the book was opened the words of fate were uttered the golden circlet slipped on to her trembling hand and mrs dyce lashmar passed forth upon her husband's arm to the carriage that awaited them a week went by they were staying at dawlish and lashmar who had quite come round to his wife's opinion on the subject of the honeymoon cared not how long these days of contented indolence lulled his ambitious soul at times he was even touched by the devotion which repaid his sacrifice a certain timidity which clung to iris a tremulous solicitude which marked her behaviour to him became her he thought very well indeed constance bride was right he could not have been thus at his ease with a woman capable of reading his thoughts and of criticising them he talked at large of his prospects which took a hue from the halcyon sea and sky one morning they had strolled along the cliffs and in a sunny hollow they sat down to rest dyce took from his pocket a newspaper he had bought on coming forth let us see what fools are doing he said genially iris watched him with uneasy eye the sight of a newspaper was dreadful to her yet she always eagerly scanned those that came under her notice lying now on the dry turf she was able to read one page whilst dyce occupied himself with another of a sudden she began to shake then a half-stifled cry escaped her what is it asked her husband startled oh look dyce look at this she pointed him to a paragraph headed disappearance of a city man when lashmar had read it he met his wife's anguished look with surprise and misgiving you've had a precious narrow escape of course this is nothing to you now oh but i'm afraid it is i'm afraid it is dyce what do you mean didn't you get everything out of his hands i thought it was safe i left it till we were back at home lashmar started to his feet pale as death what then all your money is lost oh surely not how can it be we must make inquiries at once inquiries inquiries enough have been made you may depend upon it before this got into the papers why read the fellow has bolted the police are after him he has robbed and swindled right and left do you imagine your money has escaped his clutches they stood face to face dear don't be angry with me sounded from iris in a choking voice i am not to blame i couldn't help it oh don't look at me like that dear husband but you have been outrageously careless what right had you to expose us to this danger ass that i was ass ass that i was i wanted to speak of it and my cursed delicacy prevented me what right had you to behave so idiotically he set off at a great speed towards dawlish iris ran after him caught his arm clung to him where are you going you won't leave me i'm going to london of course was his only reply as he strode on 
running by his side iris told with broken breath of the offer of marriage she had received from wrybolt not long ago she understood now why he wished to marry her no doubt he already found himself in grave difficulties and saw this as a chance either of obtaining money or of concealing a fraud he had already practised at her expense why didn't you tell me that before cried lashmar savagely what right had you to keep it from me i ought to have told you oh do forgive me don't walk so quickly dyce i haven't the strength to keep up with you you know that he hadn't everything most fortunately not everything with an exclamation of wrathful contempt the man pursued his way iris fell back she tottered she sank to her knee upon the grass moaning sobbing only when he was fifty yards ahead did dyce pause and look back already she was running after him again he turned and walked less quickly at length there was a touch upon his arm dear dear don't you love me panted a scarce audible voice don't be a greater idiot than you have been already was his fierce reply i have to get to london and look after your business that's enough to think about just now in less than an hour they had taken train by early evening they reached paddington station whence they set forth to call upon the person whom iris mentioned as most likely to be able to inform them concerning wrybolt it was the athletic mr barker who dwelt with his parents at highgate an interview with this gentleman who was caught at dinner put an end to the faint hope slashmar had tried to entertain wrybolt said barker was not a very interesting criminal the frauds he had perpetrated were not great enough to make his case sensational but there could be no shadow of doubt that he had turned his trusteeship to the best account he is nothing but his skin to pay with added the young city man and i wouldn't give much for that don't distress yourself mrs lashmar i know a lady who is let in worse than you considerably worse the newly married couple made their way to west hampstead the servant who had been left in charge of the house did not conceal her surprise as she admitted them it was nearly ten o'clock in the evening i suppose we must have something to eat said dyce sullenly you must be very hungry iris answered regarding him like a frightened but affectionate dog that eyes its master jane shall get something at once they sat down to such a supper as could be prepared at a moment's notice by good fortune a bottle of claret had been found and excepting one glass which his wife thankfully swallowed lashmar drank it all at an ordinary time this excess would have laid him prostrate in the present state of his nerves it did him nothing but good a healthier hue mantled on his cheeks and he began to look furtively at iris with eyes which had lost their evil expression she so exhausted that she could scarce support herself on the chair timidly met these glances but as yet no word was spoken why haven't you eaten anything asked dyce at length breaking the silence with a voice which was almost natural i have dear yes a bit of bread come eat you'll be ill if you don't she tried to obey tears began to trickle down her face what's the use of going on like that lashmar exclaimed petulantly rather than in anger you're tired to death if you really can't eat anything better go to bed we shall see how things look in the morning iris rose and came towards him thank you dear for speaking so kindly i don't deserve it oh we won't say anything about that he replied with an air of generosity then laughing aren't you going to show me the study dice i haven't the heart she began to weep in earnest nonsense let us go and look at it i'll carry the lamp they left the room and iris struggling with her tears led the way to the study door as he entered dice gave an exclamation of pleasure the little room was furnished and adorned very tastefully hook shelves with all lashmar's own books carefully arranged and many new volumes added made a pleasant show a handsome writing-table and chair seemed to invite to pen-work i could have done something here dyce remarked with a nodding of the head iris came nearer timidly she laid a hand upon his shoulder appealingly she gazed into his face dear it was a just audible whisper you are so clever you are so far above ordinary men lashmar smiled his arm fell lightly about her waist we have still nearly two hundred pounds a year the whisper continued there's len but i must take him from school pooh we'll talk about that a cry of gratitude escaped her dice how good you are how bravely you hear it my own dear husband i'll do anything anything we needn't have a servant i'll work i don't care anything if you still love me say you still love me he kissed her hair it's certain i don't hate you 
well we'll see how things look to-morrow who knows it may be the real beginning of my career end of chapter thirty end of our friend the charlatan by george gissing